This is a video for Music 307 on the Middle East. In this video, we will be covering Turkey, Iran, Egypt, Israel, Sufism, Judaism, and Armenia. Let's get started. Here's a map of the Middle East. You'll see that it includes parts of Northern Africa and areas up into the former Soviet Union. We're going to be dealing mostly with that central part, the countries of Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Armenia. The Middle East is the cradle of many of the most important world religions, including Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. These are ancient civilizations that have had a tremendous impact on Europe. Languages spoken include Arabic, Turkish, Persian, and Armenian. We are going to start in Turkey, where we're going to listen to two pieces, the Islamic call to prayer and an Arabic modal improvisation. Turkey is a crossroads between Europe and Asia. The ancient city of Constantinople, which during the Ottoman Empire was changed to Istanbul, that's in quotes because there is a song there, really fun one. The Ottoman Empire and Istanbul are the crossroads between Europe and Asia, and culture flowed between uh, Europe and Asia through Istanbul. The Ottomans and Arabs exerted a tremendous influence on European music, being a very old culture that had established a long musical civilization. Let's begin with the Islamic call to prayer. Here it is. Give it a listen. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. This is just an excerpt. As with all these examples, please listen to the entire uh, listening example on your own. So our first impressions of this example is that it's singing, but in reality, it's heightened speech. As a matter of fact, we'll talk about how for Muslims, this is not considered music at all. Yet what we hear is a very musical sound of a male voice, a highly melismatic male voice singing Allah is great. In that example, you heard the call to prayer sung by the muezzin. That's the man who calls Muslims to prayer from the top of a minaret five times a day. In this photo, you see the holiest shrine of Islam. Muslims, followers of Islam, try to make a hajj, that's a pilgrimage, to Mecca at least once in their lifetime. As I said before, the call to prayer is not even considered music for Muslims. Also in the non-music category are Quranic chants, pilgrimage chants, and chanted poetry. Music is considered family and celebratory music, as well as occupational music, like shepherd songs and work songs, and military music. Let's listen to an Arabic modal improvisation. Thank you. 
In that example, you hear two instruments, an oud and a bouzouk. The oud, the instrument to your left, is the ancestor of the modern guitar. In um, Arabic, you, you call it the oud, aloud. As a matter of fact, when it was brought to Spain by the Arabs, people asked, what is that instrument? And Spaniards were told, lud. And they said, what, lud, lut? Okay, we'll call it the lut. And that's where the, our word lut comes from. The uh, higher pitched instrument is the buzuk, which is the ancestor of the mandolin. And so you heard a improvisation, a free rhythm improvisation called a taksim with the oud, and then you heard the buzuk come in and continue the improvisation, um, starting with what the oud had did and done and, and sort of taking off from that improvisation. They're improvising using a melodic system, a modal system called makam, and it's a kind of compositional kit similar to the system of raga in Indian music, where you have scales. In this case, Arabic scales are based on 24 pitches per octave, and you have uh, modes, you have a hierarchy of pitches, and each makam represents a different mood. Cultural considerations. The aim of Arabic music is to help the listener get to a state of tarab, or ecstasy. As I said before, there are several attitudes about music in Islam. Music for worship is considered legitimate. Controversial styles of music would be entertainment and non-Islamic sacred music. And the most illegitimate form of music is sensual music, such as American pop. Connections to the West. Almost all of our Western instruments have ancestors from the Arab world. This includes just about every instrument that you would be playing in an orchestra or in a band. Much of our music theory probably comes from the Arabs. Al-Farabi wrote Kitab al-Musika, the great book of music, in the year 930, most, the most influential medieval treatise on music. It is also likely the troubadours system of solfege that we use and some aspects of our notation were influenced by the Arabs and Moors in Spain. Beethoven, Mozart, and Tchaikovsky were all influenced by Arab music and you hear elements of Turkish songs and Turkish marches in their, in their uh, music and their symphonies and ballets. Next we move to Iran where we will listen to a daska for santur and voice. Iran is largely mountainous. The language in Iran is called Persian or Farsi, not Arabic, and it's predominantly Shia Muslim, which is the more conservative Muslim sect. It has been a theocracy, a religious government since 1979, when the Shah, who was supported by the US government, was ousted in a revolution. Since then, the United States and Iran have had a very strained relationship. Let's listen to a piece, a daska for santur, which is a hammer dulcimer and voice. Listen to the whole piece on your own. 
as you can hear in this example, ornamentation is uh, very present and it's typical in a lot of Persian classical music, especially vocal improvisation. The music may sound a little sad, which many people feel reflects the hardships of living in the harsh environment of Iran and the sad history, it being sort of a crossroads and um, being the site of many empires going back and forth between Asia and the Middle East. The Santur is a hammered zither, you can also describe it as a dulcimer. It is a very ancient instrument, possibly the most ancient instrument of its type. It spread eastward toward China and westward toward Europe. In Eastern Europe, it became known as the Cymbalon. It grew in size and petals were added and eventually the Italians took this instrument as a model for the piano. So it is the ancestor of the piano. The Dasga system is similar to the Raga system in India. It denotes mode in the classical Persian tradition. And um, uh, there's a vast body of composed melodies that are associated with East, each Dasga. These short melodic compositions are known as Gusha. And each daska has a collection of gusha associated with it. A radif is a collection of these gusha used in association with a particular school of daska performance. Cultural considerations. There are many different schools of classical performance or schools of daska in Iran. Typically, non-metered music is preferred over metered music. So if you go to see an entire Persian classical concert, which may last two or three hours, about 80 or 90% of it will be non-metered and improvised. This is a classical kind of tradition um, that developed around courts several thousand years ago with formal training performed in formal concert venues. Connections to the West. Southern California has the largest concentration of Persians outside of Iran. It's known as Terangelis, and it's the home of the Persian popular music industry. Gugush is one of the most famous Persian pop singers. She um, did a concert a few years ago at the Staples Center. Actually, she sold out three nights at the Staples Center. So she's very popular, and she's just one of the many uh, Persian divas similar to the many divas that we have here in American pop music. Our next stop is Egypt, where we will learn about an Arabic tak ensemble. Egypt, as you well know, is the land of pyramids and pharaohs. Suez Canal connected the Indian Ocean in South Asia with the Mediterranean and the Europe, uh, Europeans back in 1869 and Europe is now a very modern country and modern democracy, some would say. Let's listen to an Arabic tak ensemble, which is the kind of music that's often associated with belly dance. The tak ensemble includes the oud, which as you already know is a fretted plucked lute, uh, kamanche, which is a fretless fiddle, um, um, spike fiddle, horizontal, uh, kanun, which is a plucked zither, similar to the santur, but plucked with picks, the ne, which is an end blown flute, and a number of different rhythm instruments, the rik, the duff, and the tabla. And I just want to make sure you know that the tabla here in Arabic music is not the same as the tabla in Indian music. So let's give a listen.
Melodic forms are common in takt ensemble performance. Bashraf is a form with a recurring melody, as in this audio example. And the use of rhythmic modes, which are called ikat, are also common. And these ikat are similar to our idea of meter, but they're much more complex and sometimes involve much more uh, longer meters than duple or triple. Here you see the musicians in a talk ensemble uh, from left to right. Uh, the oud, a singer, kanun, and a darabuka drum. Cultural considerations. Again, this is music often associated with belly dance. And like all Middle Eastern and Arabic music, the music is meant to evoke emotion. Connections to the West. Belly dance originates from rocks, sharky, and artistic dance from Egypt. Western composers such as Verdi were interested in Middle Eastern and Egypt mu Egyptian music and Verdi composed the opera Aida, which is set in Egypt and premiered in Cairo in 1871. Jazz and orchestral music have had an influence on Egyptian popular music since the 1930s. And the most popular Egyptian singer of all time is Um Kultum, also known as the voice of Egypt. You will um, hopefully listen to the entire clip at the end of this video in uh, the slide for further listening to hear a little bit of her and to hear not only her her technique and her virtuosity but how revered she is by the audience that she is performing for next up we're going to talk a little bit about sufism and hear a little bit of a dakir ceremony the sufis are the mystical branch of islam noted for their suf robes made out of wool. It is common in Turkey, but you find it across the Middle East. And the practitioners of Sufism are called dervishes. Let's begin with a Sufi dakir ceremony. Allah, 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 Allah. What you hear is just a short excerpt of a listening example, which is just a short excerpt of a much longer ceremony that lost uh, several hours. And what you hear are the same instruments that you heard in the talk example, with the neigh sort of having a high prominence along with the singing. There's two different parts to our listening example, unison singing, followed by a melismatic chant in a free rhythm with some rhythm in the background. So this music accompanies a ceremony called a dakir, which means remembrance. And while the music is going on, you will see these dervishes come into the ritual space and they remove their robes, revealing these long flowing uh, uh, garments and they start spinning for hours and hours 
it's quite a sight. Uh, there's a, a great video at the end of this presentation that I want you to watch and uh, so you can get a sense of what's going on in these ceremonies. It's just a very short video, uh, that, but it gives you an idea of what, what this dance uh, uh, looks like. Um, it use, and the, the dervishes use music as a spiritual ladder to achieve oneness with Allah. So they've been termed whirling dervishes, and uh, it's quite a beautiful sight. And as I said at the end of this entire video presentation, please take some time to watch the short video that I provided for you that explains what's going on and gives you a glimpse of what it feels like to be at one of these ceremonies and watch these whirling dervishes. Connections to the West. Rumi, is the founder of one of the main Sufi sects, is the world's most popular poet. And I've included a poem uh, for you to enjoy here in this slide. Many Westerners have converted to Sufism and the most prominent musicians that you may know that have done so are Cat Stevens, who uh, became Sufi in the 1970s and dropped out of music for a while. Uh, you probably know him from the song Peace Train or Moon Shadow. And one of my favorite musicians, Richard Thompson, a great guitarist and songwriter, um, one of the founders of the English group Fairport Convention. And uh, mm -hmm. if you want to hear a great song, check out his song, live uh, song, 52 Vincent Black Lightning. Next is Judaism, where we will listen to a liturgical cantillation. Israel is the holy land for Jews, as well as Christian and Muslims. Jews dispersed throughout Europe one stream coming across northern Africa into Spain before the 1400s. These are the Sephardic Jews. And another stream going into Eastern Europe. These are the Ashkenazi Jews. Let's listen to a Jewish cantillation. First impressions for Jewish cantillation is that it's more of a sung recitation. The cantor or the singer sings in sort of a speech kind of rhythm with the use of many melodic formulas. There is no one way to sing the Torah, uh, so each cantor interprets it in his or her own way. Let's listen. <laughs> Veshifrecho elekinu mi pinu liomush le oilom voed. Ki ke mele kodo ve kodo ho shoto. Bodu hato adoshem. Ok ha kodo Cultural considerations. In the previous example you heard, the cantor singing a portion of the Torah in a synagogue. And typically there are, in, in traditional or conservative Judaism, there are no musical instruments, but you may occasionally hear the, 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 the shofar, which is a ram's horn that's used for special occasions. There's two different streams, religious and secular music. And lately there's been the development of contemporary religious Jewish music incorporating folk, pop, and rock influences using guitars and other instruments. As far as secular music, the most popular and well-known is klezmer music, which is wedding music that was developed by the Ashkenazi Jews in Eastern Europe. It is a style of music that is now popular in the US and worldwide. And in the photos below, you'll see an early klezmer band in Eastern Europe. And on the right, one of the modern uh, klezmer bands from the United States, the Klezmatics. Next, we will move on to Armenia. There's a beautiful photo of one of the monasteries. The Armenian people can be traced back 3,000 years 
Armenia is the first Christian nation adopting Christianity in the year 301 AD. Very well known is the Amer Armenian Genocide of 1915, where 1.5 million Armenians were estimated to be killed. Musically, much of Armenian music is monophonic, with scales that are based on tetrachords of four notes, where the last or the highest of the four notes is the first note of the next, next tetrachord. The most unique Armenian instrument is certainly the duduk. It's the national instrument. It is a single reed instrument made of the wood from an apricot tree. It has a very sad song sound to it, and many people feel it reflects the sad history of Armenia. The most important figure in Armenian music is Komitas. And Komitas is the founder of the Armenian National Music School. He was an ethnomusicologist and composer who used folk materials and folk songs to compose modern songs and classical pieces, many of which are still performed today. Dance is a very important part of Armenian culture. Music and dance are connected very closely, and each dance reflects the unique area from which it comes from in Armenia, so it's part of the identity of the people. Dance could be for many different uh, occasions, secular and social and religious. Similar to Iranians, Southern California is the home to the largest Armenian population outside of Armenia. And the Duduk has been used in many soundtracks, such as movies like Avatar and Gladiator and shows like Game of Thrones. Certainly the most famous American band of Armenian descent is System, is System of a Down, who hail from Glendale and are led by Serge Tonkian. For further listening, I've provided a number of different uh, slides for you to listen to or, or clips, and uh, the first of which is a beautiful one called Dream by the Dudu Quintet Winds of Passion. Please listen to the whole thing, close your eyes. It's one of my favorite pieces to, to uh, whenever there's a very sad occasion. Most uh, famously in Music 307, the day after 9-11, I played this piece as a way for us all to commemorate uh, the tragedy that happened on that day. There's a wonderful clip of Itzhak Perlman, possibly the world's most famous uh, violinist, playing with the Klezmer group, and uh, I think you'll enjoy that very much. I also provided a great video clip of whirling dervishes uh, so that you can get a feel for what a ceremony is like. Uh, it's a short clip, uh, the entire performance of Whirling Dervishes very often last two hours. And finally, I've included clips from two of the famous pop singers I spoke about, uh, the voice of Egypt, Uncle Tum, um, and also the uh, Persian diva, Gugush. I hope you enjoy them all. <laughs> 